Good morning. We thought we would actually start with a prayer, and this is a prayer that I've heard many young uh, students and graduate students have often said before an examination or um, starting or embarking on their research. Some have called it the, uh, you know, the examination prayer, the studies prayer, but we wanted to offer it for everyone here um, and all the members on the panel and for everyone in this room who is uh, investigating truth. And that's really, I think, something that we're all engaged in. So I'm going to pass this on. O oh God, O oh Thou who hast cast Thy splendor over the luminous realities of men, shedding upon them the resplendent lights of knowledge and guidance, and hast chosen them out of all created things for this supernal grace, and hast caused them to encompass all things, to understand their inmost essence, and to disclose their mysteries bringing them forth out of darkness into the visible world. He verily showeth his special mercy to whomsoever he will. O Lord, help thou thy loved ones to acquire knowledge and the sciences and arts and to unravel the secrets that are treasured up in the inmost reality of all created beings. Make them to hear the hidden truths that are written and embedded in the heart of all that is. Make them to be in signs of guidance amongst all creatures in piercing rays of the mind-shedding light. In this, the first life. Make them to be leaders unto thee, guides unto thy path, runners urging men on to thy kingdom. Thou verily art the powerful, the protector, the potent, the defender, the mighty, the most generous. Well, Laupa, friends, again, um, I'm very happy to introduce this panel. Um, the, the focus of this panel really comes from what Shogi Effendi encouraged young Baha'is to do. Um, in, in addition to the deep study of the faith, he's, he really encouraged Baha'is to investigate and analyze the teachings of the faith and to correlate those with, um, as Dr. Khan was saying, the modern aspects of philosophy and science. Um, and so during this next uh, hour or so, we're going to have a chance to hear about the panelists' experience uh, integrating Baha'i principles in their academic and also their work environments. Uh, something that I think is really wonderful about this group of panelists um, that I'm going to reveal before introducing all of them is that all of them have been deeply involved in the institute process. Uh, all of them have actually I believe completed the full sequence, and many have uh, been serving as tutors. And I think it's something that we're finding throughout this, the course of this conference and at this time in Baha'i history, um, this unique uh, challenge and opportunity of learning how we can integrate um, our service within the Baha'i community and service through participating in these core activities and integrating the insights that we draw into our various fields of study. There was a letter written by the House of Justice that I think really illuminates this integration. It wrote that there certainly is great value in the initiative taken by individuals to engage in scholarly study of the writings for its own sake. However, a greater value accrues to both the individual and the community when the motive for such study is prompted by a desire to serve the aim of the plan. So I'm really excited also to hear from our panelists um, just about this process of integration between um, their experience of studying both within the academic world and also within the Baha'i community. 
Uh, in terms of the format, we're going to have a chance first to hear from each of the members of the panel. Then we're going to open it up to everyone here for your thoughts, uh, your questions, your comments. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that towards the end there'll be more of a dialogue. Um, our first panelist is Rachel Enslow. Rachel just graduated from Stanford uh, with a bachelor's degree in me mechanical engineering. She's followed by uh, William Silva, who is in a master's program in international multicultural education. And during the daylight hours, uh, Willie, Billy also uh, works in the financial field. Uh, he's followed by Anne Gillette, who recently completed her master's degree in international economics, and her focus is on development. She's followed by Shabna Mazad, who is the recent uh, mother of a two-week-old, two-month-old two baby, Alia, and she completed her uh, doctorate recently at Berkeley in education, and she's now teaching at the University of San Francisco. And she'll be followed by David Deal, who is now currently uh, working on his doctorate at Stanford in the Department of Sociology and Education. So he will clarify that. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Good morning, friends. Um, I I Thanks. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, OK. I just feel, um, to start off, I feel very humbled to be a part of this panel, and I hope that maybe some of my insights um, will be useful. Uh, when I was first asked to be on this panel, I was thinking about uh, Baha'i scholarship and how the Baha'i teachings can be applied to mechanical engineering, and I was having a hard time really wrapping my mind around that because um, throughout my academics, that hasn't really been um, the focus or the reason why I've chosen mechanical engineering to apply um, Baha'i the, um, theology you know, to the application. But um, there are two points that I, that I wanted to make um, about serving the Baha'i faith and kind of choosing um, a path of um, study. And I think that the Baha'i faith really inspired me to actually go into a field of engineering because um, in the writings it says that uh, that words, um, that academics pursuit should not end at words, that they should end at deeds. And so for me, um, the application of science was really a way of doing that. And through uh, my engineering experience, I've realized that it's not only about the deeds and the technology, it's about the way that technology is applied that can really uh, make a difference. And I'll give you an example from, from my life of how I've learned that. Last summer, I spent uh, about two months in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands doing tsunami relief work. And I think all of us in the group, uh, we were all a bunch of uh, Stanford students, were really interested in serving humanity and really um, addressing the needs of what was going on in those islands with the destruction of the tsunami. And when we got there, uh, we realized that it wasn't just about the application of technology. We needed to apply principles. And for me, those were spiritual principles of um, consultation, of really addressing what the needs of the people were, and to do so in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a humble way. Um, one of the biggest eye-openers for me was the amount of ego that was involved in that development process, that when NGOs started vying for each other for projects, that their projects almost became futile. Uh, an example is that uh, they were kind of vying for how to install toilet systems um, <laughs> and in these temporary housing units, and one of the NGOs went in and had all the money, and they put in these great toilets, but they did so in such a way that the people couldn't actually use them, because in India, you need water when you use a toilet, and the well was some 100 feet away from the toilets. So in, a, in essence, they ended up with a hygiene problem, because no one was using these, um, this infrastructure um, on their site. Uh, the other concept that I really wanted to focus on was balance in serving the Baha'i community while being a student. Uh, when I started off my university studies, I just finished a year in China and was so excited about the institute process and in learning how to uh, 
serve the Baha'i community as a capacity, in the capacity of a tutor. And um, it got to the point where um, after about three years, I was spending probably eight hours a week doing institute activities, serving on institutions. And um, it really hit me when one of my friends said, you know, we really miss hanging out with you because you're always spending all your time at Baha'i meetings. And I realized at that point that I hadn't integrated um, my Baha'i service with my own life, that it was kind of compartmentalized. And I needed to break that, um, that habit. And so soon after that, I transferred schools to Stanford, and that was really a time for me to start anew. And I spent a year just making friends. And in this last year of my studies, had the op really the opportunity to learn how to integrate that process. Um, and I must say that that integration wouldn't have happened without the encouragement um, of the Baha'i friends in that area, because we worked in small teams to kind of encourage and feed off of the energy of, um, of each other. Um, and in my last year was probably the, the hardest academic year of my life. I was um, sometimes spending 30 hours on a weekend working on projects, and when you have two project-based classes, that adds up to a lot of time. But it was also the most rewarding because I was able to uh, really be touched by sharing the Baha'i faith with my friends. On Tuesday nights at 11 p.m., my roommate and one of my housemates and I would get together and say prayers. And I think that when you're only getting four to six hours of night of sleep, of sleep, that being able to say prayers with your friends is such a bounty and it's such a joy and it's um, probably one of the most relaxing things that you can do. And um, then to go on with the same friend and some other friends to start doing the institute courses together. And I think for me, this was really where Baha'i scholarship has started to develop in my life because uh, when I'm in doing institute courses with your non-Baha'i friends, it's so invigorating the questions that they ask. And it really calls you to a higher level to be able to answer those questions um, in a fulfilling way, not only for yourself, but also for them. Thank you very much. So good morning, friends. Um, as Shala mentioned, my name is Billy Silva, and I live and work here in San Francisco. And um, during the day, I work for an investment banking company that does um, a lot of work with private companies that are looking for funding and things along those lines. And um, in the evenings and afternoons and on the weekends, I go to school at USF um, and study international and multicultural education. And then in the other time, we're doing things that have to do with the five-year plan, like study circles and training institutes. <laughs> so we get pretty busy. And um, one of the questions that comes up often is because these three um, aspects of you know, individual life are kind of different, how do we integrate? You know, how, do I, how, how are you able to integrate all of them together? And it takes a little bit of search, but um, I have just a, a brief story about how it's sort of working for me a little bit and maybe some of the implications of it. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that happens um, in my uh, job is that we have, because San Francisco has Berkeley and Stanford and a lot of the universities, one of the things that we get there are a tremendous number of interns. So we have a big internship program. And over the last couple of years, what we've noticed is that a good majority of the interns are international students. They come from other countries. And we looked this year, and I'd say 15 out of the 25 interns were from different countries. And they were from all over the world. And I mean, England, uh, Russia, Italy, Turkey, all through the um, Africa and all through Asia and um, different parts of Europe. So it was an extremely diverse group. And in the past, what happens with these internships, or as in any job, uh, I think a lot of jobs out there, is we're really worried in the employment situation, how are these people or how are these new employees going to serve our own purposes and how are they going to serve our own needs? So the way that the curriculum and things like that are set up are to see who has the capacities and who has already studied and who has the right vocabulary, who understands what's going on already, so that when the internship program is over, maybe we can offer that one individual person a job and the rest of them are just sort of left to kind of, you know, just sort of flounder a little bit. So what happened uh, at, at my job is that in the past year, we started thinking about, or I started thinking a little bit about 
uh, maybe applying one or two Baha'i principles. Now, because of the nature of the business, there's some principles and virtues that are really intuitive, like you know, honesty and trustworthiness and integrity and justice and things along those lines. But one of the ones that we started, we implemented this year that made a tremendous shift in the results that we saw, not only for our, our company's purposes, but also for the purposes of the, uh, the interns themselves and how they uh, received the program, was to think of the concept or the principle of being of service to them. So for many years, we were thinking that they were going to be of service to us. This time, we looked at them as, as how can we be of service to the interns? Uh, all of them speak English as a second language. So as you know, during the day, it's, it gets very, very busy, and um, it's a little challenging to speak to someone who maybe learned English a year ago or two years ago. How much time do you really have to put into that and take the time out of your day to do so? But we made a little bit of a shift in thinking um, how we were going to be of service to them, and it completely changed the entire nature of what was going on in our office with just that one, uh, introducing that one tiny Baha'i principle. Uh, a lot of different questions began to be asked, like what is the curriculum going to look like? Um, how are we going to make sure that if they don't have the uh, correct vocabulary and language um, to be able to thrive and survive and find success in this particular field, how can we introduce it to them? Um, and I mean, there's several things like that came up. So over the course of the last couple of months, what we began to see from all of the interns was a, a much greater reception. They, we found a lot more employees than we had found before. Original, we would probably get out of 20 or 30. We maybe would find one or two. And at the end of this, this summer period, we found probably five or six. And I think that that specifically had to do with the fact that they found encouragement and they found that we were there looking to be of service to them as opposed to just finding out where they had been and what they could do for us. So that's just one idea, you know, of. of uh, how to introduce a Baha'i principle into you know, our, our work environment. So. Um, so my name is Anne Gillette. I just finished a master's degree in international and development economics. And, um, when Shala asked about the panel, what, what came to mind were the two main areas that I see kind of a confluence between faith and study or my profession. Um, and those were first just what, deciding what to study or when to study, when to, when to study, when to work, when to um, maybe perform what seemed to be more direct service to the faith. And then also once I was studying, kind of the insights that the faith gave me into my field. So I thought I would just touch on those. Um, my undergraduate degree was international health and development. And after I finished my undergrad degree, instead of going right to work, I decided to do a year of service. Um, and so I, I taught at a Baha'i school in India. And it ended up, that decision to be of service ended up really impacting what I studied later on. Because I was teaching at the school, it was a, about 350 students, um, only about five of whom were Baha'is, but the principal and vice principal were Baha'is. And they were doing a wonderful service to the community. It was a really well-respected school. The students, I mean, the older students were studying the Seven Valleys and the Hidden Words and Ruhi Bhagwan, and students could tell you like the order of the valleys and the seed of each valley, and you know, it was it was quite amazing. Um, but it, it began to seem to me that um, as I talked with my older students as they were going out to work or to, to go on for more schooling, none of them saw any opportunity for them in the town where they where they lived or in Darjeeling, which is the closest kind of small city. They all saw their futures in Delhi or in Bangalore at a computer, essentially. And so I began to wonder, is this school really, you know, we, the solution obviously isn't not to give these kids an education, to make them stay in their community. We want to, you know, knowledge is giving them wings, but these wings are taking them really far away from their communities. And so is the school really um, serving the community or is it actually pulling these resources out? Um, and I had studied microcredit and microfinance in my undergraduate degree to some extent, and I started thinking about how powerful it could be to combine like microcredit and grassroots economic development work with schools to have kind of more holistic development um, that would really contribute, again, in a holistic way to the growth of the community. So I started thinking, well, maybe I want to study economics, actually, not go so much into health. And I came back to the States and ended up working for two and a half years at the National Assembly's Office of External Affairs in Washington, DC. Um, and that was a great opportunity because I was able to see First of all, that global prosperity was actually one of the 
one of the themes that the Universal House of Justice had given national assemblies around the world to focus on in external affairs. So I was able to see what the National Assembly was doing on that theme, what, to some extent, what other national assemblies, how other national assemblies addressed that. And then also, just because of the nature of the work, what other non-governmental organizations were doing, how individual Baha'is could also serve. Um, so after, see, have, after that experience and just kind of considering my own aptitudes, I did decide to study economics. And then once I started studying, there really, I really saw a feedback loop between my faith and, and the study. Um, I think that Baha'is, especially in the field of economics, as we know, as Shoghi Fendi has said about many fields, Baha'is really bring new insights and important insights. And for example, in economics, as you know, economics is about resources and how people use resources to, um, to maximize well-being and to produce and consume. But all of these models are based on assumptions about the nature of human, human behavior. And if we, I think that Baha'is can bring important um, insights into what truly is at the, the base of, of human behavior and therefore what incentives humans actually do respond to. And to the extent that we're able to contribute to that conversation and improve these assumptions of the models, um, economics as a field will be much more useful because the models will actually be based on reality of, of what human beings are, not homo economicus, you know, but actual what, what human beings are, what they respond to. And then we can figure out how to create true global prosperity and how to, um, you know, what policies we need to put in place and this and that. So the whole field will become much more useful. And the exciting thing is that these discussions are going on in economics. Um, the idea of evolution of consciousness, there's, there's been an evolution of consciousness in the field of economics as well. So there's growing discussion of the need to reevaluate some of these assumptions. And actually, um, there's a field called experimental economics, which is really looking again at these assumptions and looking at the importance of things like trust and honesty and um, senses of justice and altruism, which were pretty much assumed not to take any part in economic decisions, um, but of course do. And, and real economic scholars, Baha'i and non-Baha'i, are looking at these questions. And so there's great opportunity for Baha'i contribution there. Um, and then just quickly, kind of the other half of the feedback, what, how economic study influenced my faith and my understanding of community. Economics is a science, of course, and just like the natural sciences, when you understand um, economic fundamentals and principles and processes, it gains, you, you get insight into spiritual phenomena. And so things like studying economic growth, you know, I'd be thinking, well, what does this mean about clusters? Or what does this have to say about this or that? Or the role of institutions is a big, big issue in economics. What is, you know, what are the role of the institutions in the Baha'i faith for helping our community grow? Um, and so those are, those are some of my main thoughts about scholarship. Good morning, everyone. Does this work? Um, closer. closer? It's not on. Oh, it's on. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I keep, as Shala mentioned, I have a two-month-old, and uh, this is probably the longest I've been away from her for the past two months, so I keep looking back there to <laughs> make sure she's okay. Um, I am currently working at, oh, I guess people can't hear. I, ooh. <laughs> I teach at the University of San Francisco in the International Multicultural Education Program, and I think that a lot of how I teach is informed by the lessons that I learned as a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, what I wanted to focus on today specifically is um, on research and doing research, especially social science research. Uh, one of the biggest uh, fears that I had going into academia was the separation between theory and practice. And um, I was afraid, like many of the people I've talked to, that you know, we go into academia with such rich experiences. We have, uh, people have gone on years of service, we work in schools, um, and especially in education, I had lots of experience working in school and working with nonprofits. I was always very afraid that going into academia would mean a complete separation from the people that I sought to work with and uh, the people I sought to serve. 
So um, sure enough, first year of graduate school, I found myself in uh, one of the theory classes full of um, people with amazing thoughts. But it was really limited to that, just wonderful theories, wonderful ideas, but completely limited to ideas and words, as Rachel was saying earlier. And uh, so, you know, I kept thinking to myself, if, if the purpose of education is to acquire divine virtues, then am I really doing that in this environment? And uh, when it came to thinking about a research project, we had to take different research methods courses, and all the research methods courses that I came across taught us how to do research in this very traditional way, that you go into a community, that you go into schools, you observe, you look at what's going on, you take all this wonderful information, you go, you put it all in a document, and you publish it you know, for yourself, or you put it into a dissertation and it's stacked away somewhere for the rest of your life. Um, so. All this was uh, very problematic for me, especially since I constantly was struggling to find ways in which I could connect the academy to the community um, and vice versa. So one of the things that I did was I came across participatory research as a methodology. So learning to do research in the community with members of the community and not necessarily just in the academy. So. Uh, I chose that methodology and I worked with uh, students in Nepal and with community members here to constantly try and bridge that gap and to be engaged in this very participatory process that actually uses principles of Baha'i consultation, which is something that's uh, missing in traditional research. So um, I think for me that was one of the biggest lessons um, learned in, an, in, in graduate school. And the research that I did um, ended up being that much more meaningful because I think the process itself, not necessarily the end product and the amazing new findings that we were able to bring into uh, scholarship, but the process itself, the process of being involved with the people we seek to serve, the being involved with people in the community, um, respecting experiel, experiential knowledge as much as academic knowledge. And being engaged in that process was transformative, I think, for all of us involved. And just learning from that process of consultation and um, involvement and participation and collaboration um, in trying to s solve some of these social problems was really um, one of the most profound experiences of my academic experience. So um, now, uh, as a teacher, <laughs> I encourage my students to do the same uh, because I think that's where we find some of the uh, connections as well. And in terms of uh, thinking about the institute process, while I was um, doing this type of research that involved study and then uh, c reflection and then action, having that action component, you look at our institute process and we're involved in some of the same things, studying together, reflecting together, and then acting together. So I think that if we can combine some of these methodologies, it's uh, definitely a wonderful way of integrating um, our Baha'i life and the Baha'i principles into um, academic and professional life. So I'll end there. <laughs> Can I use this one? this one. So I just before I start, I just wanted to say that I'm lucky enough to know all the people on this panel personally. And because of the people on this panel and because of a lot of people who are in the audience who aren't on this panel, and a lot of people I know who aren't here, that I'm just really excited about the generation of high scholars that are kind of coming up right now. I think there's some really phenomenal people who are both just great minds and really dedicated to the faith. And 
And we're at this point now where um, we have junior faculty members at University of San Francisco, at Berkeley, at Harvard, at McGill, so some of the best universities in North America and the world. And so it's just, it's just, for me at least, it's a really exciting time for, for Baha'i scholarship and this, this kind of upcoming generation. So my name is David Deal, and I am a doctoral student down the highway here at Stanford. Um, I was thinking about how long I've been there and having a hard time getting my head around the fact it's been five years now. Um, so I'm getting close. The light at the end of the tunnel is starting to emerge a little bit. Um, and so my work is all in sociology of education, um, which essentially just means that I do sociology and look at, at schools, at um, just different places where, where um, kids are being socialized and being educated. And um, just to step back a little bit, I mean, I think, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I, that particular field for me has a lot to do with the fact I think that's about as close as there is to a family business in my family. Um, both my parents have doctorates in education. They're both classroom teachers, went on and did different things in the field. Um, but speaking to this theme, I think as I've kind of gone through this process and I've started to narrow the questions that I'm interested in and kind of honed in on specific things and different kinds of methodologies, I think the thing that for me has always been in the forefront of my mind, um, because there's a lot of different ways you can tackle these different problems, is always thinking about trying to find things where, where I could see a direct analog in the Baha'i community. So looking at questions about schools and about um, organizations like that that had a direct um, some kind of direct analog with the Baha'i community. So, so as I could learn about the way these things were working in different organizations, I could carry that over into understanding the Baha'i community better. Um, and so one of the areas I work especially with is in social network analysis, which is essentially looking at the patterns of people's relationships and that how that kind of impacts um, you know, the culture of organizations, how people do their work, things like that. So looking at schools, that tends to be, you know, how do, how do teachers' relationships, their friendships influence how they teach, what they believe, these kinds of things. Um, you know, how information gets from certain places to other places. And so just as an example of how I'm trying to use some of, these, um, some of these ideas in terms of kind of applying to the Baha'i community. So I live in San Francisco. That's the community I live in. And um, just recently, uh, I'm going to propose something to the LSA, and we're going to do this project where... Like a lot of communities, San Francisco is trying to do home visits as part of the institute process, um, especially focusing, I think, on, on home visits for people who maybe we haven't seen in a long time, who aren't coming to feast, or maybe aren't as connected. And I think a lot of communities do this, and often what we try to do is we get a list of names and maybe assign people to contact those people. But there's not a lot of thought often in terms of who already has pre-existing relationships with those people. And then using those pre-existing relationships as leverage to, to kind of get those people back involved. I mean, it's a very different thing if someone contacts you that you know and you have a friendship with than kind of a cold call from someone. And so the project essentially is creating a, a network map, a kind of relational map of the San Francisco community to kind of figure out who knows who, who has contact with who, and then use that as a way to kind of try to bring in people who perhaps we haven't seen in a while. So at least right now, that's, the, that's, that's one area where I'm trying to kind of make this connection. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, all of the panelists. Um, and now we're really excited to hear from you um, and just hear any thoughts you might have, uh, contributions or questions for any of the members of the panel. Um, I think you could just sort of raise your hand and uh, we'll just sort of call out whoever um, would like to ask a question. I don't know, is, this a, is that a mic there for people to use or is it just... Uh, I think if people project, that should be fine as well, if, the, if that's not on. <laughs> yes. This question is directed to any of the members of the panel. Uh, I have a grandson who is eight years old. I would like him to become one day a Baha'i scholar. Uh, 
We have some nascent institutions coming up, such as the school in Canada, the Maxwell School. How do you feel about directing our children, perhaps, towards one of these burgeoning or beginning uh, schools, and then perhaps matriculating to another school later? Could you speak on this, please? I guess I should answer this question because I went to Maxwell. Um, I think at this point, the intentions of um, schools like Maxwell and Nancy Campbell are very good. And I can only speak from my experiences um, and what I gained from that. For me, uh, Maxwell really opened my eyes to the possibilities of serving the Baha'i faith on a global scale. Um, having a component of service integrated into the curriculum, having uh, the opportunity to study letters um, from the World Order uh, written by Shoghi Effendi in the classroom and relating that to, um, to history was really exciting. Um, I think, and also the friendships that are created when you're living in an institution like that are some of the deepest friendships I think that I've ever made. But uh, there is a flip side too. Uh, because these institutions are so young, um, there's a lot of underfunding that goes on. And um, there is a need for teachers there. There's a need for financial support. And because of that, I think that the academic component of the school and so, schools in some ways um, is a little bit less than it could be. And they're always striving for ex excellence. That's the goal. But when you have um, students with a broad, a small group of students with a broad range of understanding, you have to kind of shoot in the middle to get um, all of their experiences. So um, what I could have used from that experience that I didn't get was having um, a more rigorous academic curriculum. But I think that the balance that it gave to me um, in terms of the arts and its service was just as valuable as having um, a, rig a rigorous academic experience. Oh, sorry, and I wish to say one more thing. Um, I think that these institutions should not be used as a place to kind of send delinquent kids. Um, <laughs> that you just want to kind of fix and you say just throw them in the Baha'i um, school, they'll, they'll come out better. Because it really distracts and takes away from the entire community. While some students who are really struggling um, with issues may grow and develop very well there and it may be a great experience, others of them don't and end up fighting the system so much that they pull um, energy away from the experience of so many other students. It's not even that significant, so. Um, but I just, I went to a public school, I was the only Baha'i in my school, um, and then, and it was, I mean, I had a very good experience. Um, but at college, my, my academic advisor was actually Holly Hansen, who's there in the audience, um, who many of you know, she's um, very well respected in her field as an academic, and then also very dedicated to serving the faith and um, to Baha'i scholarship. And that was, that was really, um, just having that sort of mentor academically and also in service to the faith and Baha'i scholarship was, I think, um, very significant for me. So I didn't, I just, I think it's kind of relevant to the idea of, um, you know, Baha'i school or public school or what. And if, even in, at the high school age, I think it'd be fantastic if, if young Baha'is could come to these sorts of conferences and really try to make connections with Baha'i scholars who are working in fields that they're interested in and try to set up those mentoring relationships because they can be very, very powerful. Yeah, I'd like to ask, you know, listening to all of you and also in the conference in general, one of the things that I'm finding is that there's so many Baha'is doing such interesting work. And I fear that we're not as well networked as we might be. 
And I'm wondering, you know, beyond this conference itself and the association and the interest groups in the association, um, what can be done or do you know anyone who's doing some really good work in terms of creating networks of Baha'is who can be sharing this information with one another so I don't spend years in my field and never meet one of you who I should have been talking to five years ago because we're working on the same stuff. I was going to say, if anyone also in the audience wants to respond to any of these questions, if you have some insight, please uh, feel free also to jump in. Um, on that, on the topic though of networking, I think these conferences are great opportunities. Um, now, I guess with the internet, more groups can perhaps communicate or meet one another virtually <laughs> within a field, perhaps through that that structure. I. I know that there are the special interest groups that have formed, um, that meet at the early part of the conference, and they are formed around certain topics or fields of study. Um, so definitely, I, I think taking advantage of those uh, pre-existing groups and working within those, I think, could really benefit um, that process of networking and uh, supporting one another. But if anyone else you know, has other thoughts or insights, uh, please feel free to jump in. Or other questions. So I, I saw a hand back um, in the. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting imp expose. Sorry, I felt that the overarching theme uh, that everybody addressed uh, to certain extents was how to integrate Baha'i principles and uh, academia, professional life, um, in a more harmonious way. And um, academia or education to me is very much today about critical analysis of fact, about debates, about contention, about controversy. And if we look at Baha'i writings, the Guardian also speaks about consultation in a very similar way. He says that without, and I hope that I quote him right here, without clashes of opinion, the spark of truth cannot emerge. Um, I wonder um, if today, if we are adequately practicing this principle of consultation, which is intrinsically linked to educational academic principles, and if we don't circumvent it oftentimes out of fear of creating disharmony, um, disunity, and others, and by doing so possibly prevent a real move forward uh, within consultation, which I find to be quite... Um, quite groundbreaking, really, in theory, in which I feel we're, we're quite, very, quite far away in our practical application. Thank you. Can I uh, see if I understand the question is really how are Baha'is applying that principle of consultation within the academic world? Um, I'm wondering how could we improve, um, improve. practicing this, this particular aspect of engaging in clashes of opinion in a very polite way, mm -hmm. which I feel we're shying away from, but which really is very well established today in academia. So while we celebrate academic achievements, we shy away from actually applying them in our own community life, mm -hmm. I feel. Thanks. Anyone? I think at least in terms of, of scholarship, that, that particular piece, I think it actually gets back to the previous question and this kind of lack of networking. A lot of people kind of, I think, I think like the, the questioner said, there's a lot of people who are doing very interesting things, but they tend to be kind of isolated. And I think in some ways that's a kind of first step is to get people having the same conversation. And still people, I mean, part of the way academia works is you have certain programs, certain questions that people are kind of have a shared interest in, working from different angles, trying to tackle it in different ways and having a conversation about that. And so I think that networking question is an important piece of that because un until there's that kind of common shared set of questions, it's hard to move on to the next piece of having a productive dialogue about them. Oh, oh sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, Anne mentioned something that reminded me. Uh, in my business economics classes, I would always do really bad because it, the, the, especially in my game theory class, the, one of the assumptions was that like, the players are wealth maximizing and they're like, well-being maximizing. And I always, always like to think, no, but the, like, there's a different way of looking at it. Like, what if you prefer your friend over yourself, right? Like a Baha'i perspective? So I'd always really do really bad. I'd answer wrong, you know, answer incorrectly <laughs> because you know, I keep hoping that there's just a different way of looking at 
some economic system. And so that I would always talk to my friends about that. And now he's like, yeah, you're being too Baha'i right now. Because they even knew that, right? They even knew I was Baha'i. No. So that's, that's really interesting you mentioned that. that. <laughs> Experimental economics and change the, change the discussion. I think um, just related to that, I wanted to stress that I think it's really important for us to also introduce those alternative paradigms of thinking. I mean, there is a lot of resistance. <laughs> There's a lot of resistance, and you know, it's it's not the easiest to bring in a new way of doing and a new. Uh, but I think in the end, um, a lot of us here, I know, struggle through sort of legitimizing our own work constantly, constantly with, with advisors and with faculty members and with peers. But I think in the end, people generally do realize that there is, you know, um, there are multiple ways of looking at one thing and how important it is for us to bring in that perspective and to persevere <laughs> through um, really trying to you know, with patience, make those around us understand. So I, I have a slightly different take on it, and this is actually something I feel pretty strongly about, and I think it's, it's a, a place where Baha'i scholarship can potentially get into a lot of trouble. Um, and that is, as I was kind of thinking um, about this panel, and kind of thinking, how, how is it I think about Baha'i scholarship? A big piece of it for me is, is I think it's kind of a, it's a bilingual process. In order to kind of do good Baha'i scholarship, you really have to be bilingual. You have to be fluent both in Baha'u'llah's revelation, but also in your discipline. Um, and I think very often it is the case that there, there are, these are kind of clashing ways of viewing the world. But I think a lot of times it's really a language difference. Um, and I think, and, and certainly, I mean, economics is a place where, where there's probably a lot more clashing. But I think certainly in sociology, in my field, um, you know, a lot of it really is comes down to language. And if you're not really fluent in the field and you don't really realize what people are talking about, it becomes really easy to think that there's this gap. Um, you know, I think uh, I was having a conversation um, here with someone who, who was talking about potential doctoral work he was interested in doing, and um, he had an interest in looking at um, the, um, the spiritually transformative powers of, of NGOs that were kind of faith-based. Um, looking at like how they uh, possibly engender unity, and, and he kind of said, "Well, you know, it's, it's probably not likely I could go to a, a reputable school and do something like that." Um, but I think that it's a kind of a language thing. So if, we, if, if if you go and say, "I want to look at how unity is engendered," that might be a problem because you know talking about unity is a very it's a very diffuse thing. It's not really clear. But issues about trust, about honesty, these are actually very very. And sociology trust is one of the the kind of hottest areas right now. And it comes because there's a recognition that a lot of these things really are important. And they might be using slightly different language than we use, but I think it's important to know, like, this stuff is going on, and we can be a part of it, and we can add to it. Um, and it but it's not a completely different worldview. Some people have a very different worldview, but some people are really interested in the same kinds of questions. They're just using slightly different language. If I could just add quickly, too, about... Um like for example in economics, this work that's going on in experimental economics about revisiting some of these assumptions is very much going on in like the, you know, kind of the upper levels of academia. So it hasn't yet trickled down really to the kind of the, the building block models that you learn like in Econ 101. Um, so it's kind of the same idea, just to, to recognize that a lot of these, these discussions are happening to some extent. You might not get, get um, uh, you might not be exposed to them right away in like you know the beginning levels of the discipline, but if you can go out there and read about what the cutting edge, um, what cutting edge stuff is going on in the fields, it's really exciting. I mean, there is an evolution of consciousness too going on in the in the humanities and other fields. So, I think Marcus had a question over there.
And also, I think one more thing I'd like to quickly add is to realize that in that process of consultation and working collaboratively and bringing in different viewpoints, but I think in my experience, a really important component that's necessary that's often absent, which is what makes things complicated, is humility. Um, and so to, to keep that in mind as well. I'm really humble. I'm really humble, guys. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, during our special interest group on international affairs, uh, we were discussing this and discussing the need for a central location where everyone can collaborate um, and share ideas. And uh, one idea that popped up is, you know, the, the internet is a, you know, as a miraculous tool for collaboration that God has blessed humanity with at this stage in our development. And uh, one such website, which is a, a great example of that collaboration, is Wikipedia, where you have people sharing ideas, constantly refining their ideas, coming up with the cream of the crop, rising to the top. Um, I'm not going to go into a rap song now. But um, if, if the ABS or if Baha'i Scholarship had a central location like that where we could collaborate and share ideas and refine those ideas, uh, it would be a very powerful tool and the whole Baha'i community would have exposure to those ideas and be able to, to review them and better apply them to their lives and their communities. So. And we're gonna come up with a little nucleus of that and experiment with it, so. Yes. Good. Uh, I want to uh, refer this question to Shabnam that is um, daughter of my, one of my best friends when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. And uh, um, also because I know that she grew up in Nepal. Uh, you know, the concept of uh, scholarship in modern world, in the Western world today, is that people that they are graduated from Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley or universities that are not accessible to millions of our people all over the world. But we have thousands of Baha'i youth that all over the world, especially in third world countries. I wanted to know, as a person that has grown up in a third world country, what you would say to encourage those uh, youth to uh, realize that the Baha'i scholarship is not uh, related to uh, where we study or what we study, but it is uh, to really the spirit of our approach toward the um, science and art. Thank you, Mr. Sahba. I'd love to see you afterwards. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, most of the research I conducted in graduate school actually happened in Nepal, and I was involved with Nepali youth um, in trying to encourage them to do research on their own education system, to, to evaluate their own education system. And even among Baha'i youth in Nepal, I think in my recent travels, I've noticed that there is this trend um, about, uh, there is this trend, there's this way of thinking that in order to achieve uh, a good education or in order to uh, be a scholar, to, uh, that you do have to sort of leave your country and. Um, pursue higher education somewhere else. Uh, and uh, also I think there is, we're here and in Nepal, we're, we're constantly striving to understand what it means to be a Baha'i scholar. And um, as many of us, many of my panelists here, fellow panelists have talked about, it is that integration of um, a better understanding, a deeper understanding of Baha'i principles and knowing how to integrate that. So I think with uh, Nepali youth, I've been away from Nepal for so long right now that I'm not sure what's going on um, uh, currently in trying to make Nepali youth more aware of Baha'i scholarship and what it means. But I think it, 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 it's definitely a difficult thing because there is this very prevalent um, notion that in order to be a scholar, you do have to attain a higher degree from a university. But um, part of my own research was geared towards uh, making 
sort of bringing about this awareness of you know the organic scholar or the organic intellectual that your life experiences and your experiences um, regardless of where you are in the world count as real knowledge that it's it's a very valid form of knowledge and to build on that so um, it's an ongoing thing I don't have a concrete answer but my brother who's also here might have some insight who's <laughs> do you okay <laughs> hi I've been really touched by your presentation I'm wondering if you could tell us what community members or the community can do to assist scholars has there been anything you know that community members or communities have done that has really been helpful to you during that it's quite a difficult time you know to to go through because you do want to serve and you do have a, a heavy load of work to do so i would really like to know what what i could do to assist you know if you have anything to share about that I can offer one, just one small insight. And um, Shabnam here, who's a, a professor in the department that I go to school in, and I've consulted with her on some of the things that I was working on in the past. And I can tell you that um, a lot of the uh, progress that's been made in learning that I, I've been able to do, at least personally, has been because of the little bit of time that she's taken to sort of look over the things that I've done and offer suggestions and a ton of encouragement. So if you're in a community and there's someone there that's doing some work or, or taking some time to do such as some scholarly work, just take some time and maybe look at their work and encourage them and offer suggestions and insight and feed the consultation. I think that's what inspires people to keep going and going and going. So, and, and a little love. I've found, I've only lived in the San Francisco community for about a year now, but um, one thing that I love about the San Francisco community is that they, they immediately try to find a way for you to serve. Um, but, but, here's the but, that they also really try not to burn out people. They really, they understand that you're studying or you're doing this and that, and they understand that you are most efficient and productive if you're not, you know, spread out on 10 different committees and tutoring 10 study circles and, you know, a devotional gathering at your house every week. So they really, um, I think just... The, the local assembly, from my experience, just did a very good job of um, talking to, I can only speak from my experience, so just talking to me about what I could do, how I could serve, what I wanted to do, and then trying to find ways for me to serve that allowed me still to study, and they would ask about my studies, how things were going, but it still allowed me to feel like, you know, it wasn't an all or nothing thing, like I was at the center every day, or, you know, I was a bad Baha'i and not doing any sort of service, so they allowed a real balance. I think quickly to just add to that, um, sometimes you know, helping with other aspects of our lives is such a wonderful blessing too. And I know that with my current situation with having an infant, um, there's a specific member of our community, I don't know if she's here, Kathy Kelly, who has been coming over to the house, watching my daughter and saying, work on your syllabus, your semester is about to start. And even that kind of support from the community has meant just everything. So it's been wonderful. Hello? Okay. Um, I'd just like to also add um, another vote for encouragement. I think that the assemblies themselves can play a really important role in kind of helping people identify that they have the capacity to serve. Some people feel so humble and so inadequate that they don't necessarily step up to um, a challenge. And so um, I think uh, assemblies can do a very good job of recognizing the capacities of the people in their community and helping them find avenues of service. And also I think the encouragement can help can, is really important on a personal level. Having someone when you're doing service to the Baha'i faith who is doing it with you, you know, walking together on that um, spiritual path together is, is such a powerful experience because you learn, you're learning at the same time, at the same rate with another person, and you can provide mutual support and encouragement that you wouldn't necessarily get when you're just walking by yourself. 
Um, I would just like to s sort of pick up and push a little on, on several things that Mr. Saba and Dr. Khan said. Um, as I looked at all of you, and I think all of us are so impressed, there also was a sadness that came to me because I was thinking about a Baha'i in the Congo who was learning COBOL because that's the only textbook, COBOL language for programming, a, a, a dead programming language, because that's the only textbook available. Um, and it struck me that all over the world we have young Baha'i scholars. Uh, but, and though, the, as Dr. Khan said, the, global, the, the true globalization may be very far away and you may be fossils when it occurs, uh, a lot of us, if we're not fossils, we're already arthritic. So <laughs> I, I, I just wish to both encourage and ask you to, to think, is there some way you as young scholars could reach out and begin creating a new type of global young scholarship for Baha'i scholars? And it's not just by bringing them to our institutions, because when they come to our institutions, uh, they, they have to act as though they're in our institutions. They're not allowed to be, they're not a really, when a sociologist he probably comes from Africa or Latin America, they're really not allowed to be an African sociologist. They have to become a Stanford sociologist, let alone an American sociologist. So I was wondering if, if the young scholars, remembering how much youth has done in the history of mankind, um, mainly because life expectancy very often ended you know, Mozart at 35, that was over. Um, have, have you thought, are you open to think of ways you might take the Young Scholars Program and reach out and at least begin to do some of that long-term um, thinking and acting that will lead us to a global Young Scholars, Baha'i Young Scholars Program? Um, while you were talking, I was thinking about a friend that I have who has taken the idea of serving the Baha'i faith on a global level to, um, I think, to probably the fullest extent that she could. She grew up in, in Alaska um, in a Baha'i community, and she did her year of service in Tanzania. And after living in Tanzania for a while, she realized that if she really wanted to contribute to the well-being of the friends in Africa, that she really needed to understand their issues in her, in her heart and from a very personal level. So she then went on to go to university in Kenya, and um, she, now she's this, um, <laughs> she's this beautiful white girl, but she speaks fluent Swahili um, and has kind of an African <laughs> accent when she speaks now. But I think, at least for me, she's a real example of someone who um, is, on a personal level, addressing um, the needs of the world and really trying to take Baha'i scholarship to um, a new avenue. I'll just add one thing too. Um, my understanding of the institute process throughout the world, sort of on a global scale, is that as we develop these capacities for, um, uh, you know, ba th these capacities that I think have been mentioned on the, on the panel in terms of um, accountability, for example, to, to God, the reliance on prayer in all our activities, truthfulness. What, what many communities are finding is that building on that, um, many endeavors in terms of social and economic development are, are emerging that are based on a very rich spiritual foundation and are bringing in line with that um, knowledge of health care, for example, or education. And in some cases, I'm, the stories that I hear that are taking place in India, for example, or Africa, that are integrating, you know, uh, understandings within healthcare, for example, and spiritual insights, to me, I feel like those countries are much more advanced, you know, in many ways, in terms of applying that on a community scale, the insights from, you know, spiritual understanding as well as what they're learning um, within healthcare fields. So, you know, I'd really like to learn more from some of these, these institute processes abroad. And I think some of these stories are coming out and we're starting to hear about them. Um, but I just wanted to 
throw that out there as well. And I think that that's my understanding of what we're encouraged through, you know, as we progress through our, um, the movement of our clusters from one stage to the next is that that will, fru the fruition of that is really the, the creation of these social and economic enterprises. Um, and some countries are actually doing that in a, in a very fruitful way. So it will be nice to have more of an exchange in that field. Um, so I just throw that out. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, that our young scholars are so much involved in their uh, academic level and so conscious about uh, what is happening in their field and uh, uh, it's really admirable. Uh, at the same time, I was thinking about uh, uh, some of our uh, scholars and uh, 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 professional Baha'is who have used Baha'i principles in coming up with some methods uh, which not only, you know, uh, helping their own immediate community or uh, people that they are involved with, but can be a curriculum that other people would look into and follow. To give you an example, I'm pretty sure you know many of these uh, scholars and uh, the field that they're working on. One of the examples are, for example, Dr. Pazishkian that was here with us and he has introduced the concept of positive psychotherapy based on Baha'i principles. Or I personally know of another uh, member of uh, National Spiritual Assembly of Norway who has come up with, based on, only based on, you know, uh, hidden words of Baha'u'llah, has come up with the new method of therapy. And I'm pretty sure if all of us could focus on that, we can come up with something that other people would use as curriculum. And I think this is a good challenge for our young scholars to think in that way. I know for one, myself, if I knew about that, it would have given me a lot of, when I was studying, you know, younger ages, it would have given me a, lots of, you know, uh, uh, encouragement and uh, to go and follow that knowing that you know the knowledge that I'm gaining from education along with Baha'i principles can help you know more uh, people just than immediate. I hope I'm making sense. Does anyone? We have time probably for one more question and then um, I think we have to wrap it up, so. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I just like to mention my understanding from this conference is that scholarship or scholar is not necessarily high acad academic achievement. Um, it also means if somebody is good at something, they have the talent, natural talent, with or without education, they could be considered scholar. And if you combine this with some of the principles of the Baha'i faith, that could add up to it. And more, of course, this is the goal we are looking for. We are talking about service, using your scholar, using your academic achievement in order how to use it as a service for mankind. And therefore, I would like to say this thing. If we take the idea of eliteness of the scholar and also accept the fact that if our children are talented or they're going to a direction that it could lead to some satisfaction of themselves of what they're doing and what they're good at, they will eventually be a service to mankind because they are, they are going to be a happy individual in order, a happy individual because they are good at what they are doing. So therefore it flourishes so many things positive out of them and it would end up to be a service to mankind. My point after all of this is this, I think the parents have a huge responsibility for their parents 
to recognize what they're good at and help them academically and also through teaching the Baha'i principle it to, is to help them achieve their ability and when they achieve their ability they are going to be a scholar and they are going to be able to help mankind emphasizing again us as a human being as a parents have huge responsibility we cannot just rely as on a panel we cannot rely only on the writings of the Baha'is of just or the conferences I should say I didn't say I didn't mean the writing of Baha'is of the conferences we have the responsibility to teach and watch our children to grow properly and direct them in the right direction I think he, um, I think I heard yeah. a part of that as being maybe you you make really good role models. <laughs> can I uh, can I just address that and then David might. Um, I think that that what I what I heard from the question I think that's a wonderful point. Um, two points is that we really the focus on children's education is paramount. This begins a lot earlier than college. It begins you know, at age three or four, when, when children are starting to receive Baha'i education. And that's why I think it's such a wonderful gift that we've really been encouraged to help as a community with the education of our children and make that a priority. So I think that's a wonderful point that you brought out. And I think the second point about encouraging crafts and arts, you know, there were two, there are two or three other individuals I invited to be on the panel who couldn't make it. One was a musician, one was a dancer. Um, and they couldn't come. But I think exactly your point that you don't need to go to a, a you know, university to participate in the study of the Baha'i faith or to express the application of Baha'i principle. It can be through many, many um, avenues. And uh, I wanted, did David, did you want to add yeah. something to that? No, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, mm. And it's, I, know, it's, I know it's not a completely clean distinction, but. In my mind, I think there is an important difference between kind of scholarship in the narrow sense and scholarship in a broad sense. I think scholarship in the narrow sense is the kind of things that, that we do, and certain people in the faith will always do that. And there's a really important piece for it and place for that. But there's also scholarship in the broad sense, which is something all Baha'is are asked to do, which is essentially you know, systematically applying the writings to their lives and their communities. And, um, and there's a part of me that feels like it's a little unfortunate that we use the same word for both those things because they are relatively different. Um, but I think, I think the more, and part of this process we're going through is really having everyone start to think of themselves as scholars. Um, and that, that, you know, just being part of the institute process in a, in a sense makes you part of a scholarship process because it's a learning process and it's something that we're all called to do. And I think just to close this panel and to um, thank our panelists and thank you. I wanted to close with something that the House of Justice wrote in its introduction to the compilation on scholarship. And I think it addresses this question that this is something that we all are part of. Um, it says that this scholarly endeavor should be characterized by the welcome it offers all who wish to be involved in it, each in his or her own way, by mutual encouragement and cooperation among its participants. So thank you again for your participation.